We are going to talk today about facing God as your father rather than your judge. Facing God as your father rather than your judge. Because I say to you that if you face God as your judge at the end of your life, it would not be good for you. Because uh, God does not make exceptions for anyone. You saw when his son came here, he had to play by the same rule, observing righteousness, living a rightful life, doing everything that the father commanded him, no disobedience, in order for him to get back to heaven. So, and I tell you that uh, we all started life, God gave us the same starting point in life. We all started at the same point. You cannot say that somebody had an advantage over you in life. Because the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3 verses uh, 10 to 12. It says, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understand it. There is none that seek it after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So the Bible concludes us, every single one of us. And if you read Isaiah 53, it says that all we as sheep had gone astray. We had turned everyone to his own way. And so uh, God made sure that nobody has one up on another when it comes to our journey back to him. So we all get to start at the same point where he concluded that we are all sinners and had mercy upon us. This is why uh, the Bible says in Romans again, chapter 23, I mean chapter 3, verse 23, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Again, there is not one single person that is exempted from this. Only the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, had no sin. And he made sure that he qualified as a lamb. If you read his prayer in uh, John 17, he said, For their sake I sanctify myself. So in other words, the Lord Jesus could have run around and do whatever he wanted to do, but he chose not to. He chose obedience. He chose to be holy. He chose to obey God. He chose to do everything that pleased his father. And Thereby he qualified as a lamb that God can slay for those of us that are sinners. So God concluded that we are all sinners and we have all come short of his glory. So in other words, we are all under God's death sentence. You know somebody on, on a death row where there is no chance of you having life on your own. So we are all under God's sentence as it is written. In Ezekiel chapter 18, if you look at verse 4, he said, Behold, all souls are mine. God talking. He said, The soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. And the soul that sinneth, it shall die. This is the death sentence that God pronounced on every single person on earth. And you can say that you've been a good person and that you haven't killed anybody. And that you're not a fornicator, you don't steal, you don't cheat. You might even tell yourself that you don't lie. But how about your thoughts? Have you had an evil thought against somebody? Have you had unforgiveness against people who did you wrong or who repaid you evil for good? That's the sin. Are you secretly jealous of another person? What is it that you're doing that if God was to come, he would go like, you should not have done that. That's a sin. So the Bible says there is not one single person who is what? Righteous before God. So God decided to have mercy on us all. And in order for you to understand the nature of God, and because a lot of people, I remember when I was doing uh, street evangelism, some people used to say to me, Oh, Miss Mary, God is love. God will never send a good person to, to, to hell. 
I mean, God loves us. You are just taking it too far. You are just like uh, too much, you know. So, but God, because the Bible says that God is merciful, God is kind, and God is very patient. I, I said, yeah, he is. But guess what? God is also judge. This is why I'm bringing forth this message so that if you're being deceived or somebody has been telling you, I don't know what kind of church you're going to and they don't preach, that certain actions are sins like adultery, fornication, homosexuality, you know, covetousness and jealousy and envy and stealing and lying, then know that you're not in a church that's pointing you to the Lord. You need to be in a church where you can hear the word of God that will convict you and make you to change your life, change your ways. As the Bible says, come out from among them and be separate. Because the whole world, I mean, since we were born, nobody sat you down and uh, taught you how to lie. Nobody will teach you how to cheat. It just comes naturally to you because the devil imputes it to you from the minute you learn to walk and talk, the devil starts to uh, direct you on what to do a little baby, what are the first words that they learn? No. Rebellion. You tell them something, no. Ah, no. You know, a lot of them, that's their first word. You know, so uh, being righteous is something that you have to seriously uh, make up your mind once you receive the gift of righteousness to walk in. Because otherwise, the devil can still come and try to push your button even though you're saved so that you can keep doing wrong. And then at the end, God will count you together with uh, unbelievers and then you'll be facing him as your judge rather than your father. You know? So this, is, it, it, this, this will help us. I think really that this will help us the way that God introduced himself to us. He himself told me, he said, uh, because actually when I read this scripture, I said to God, uh, I don't get you. Why would you go before Moses and uh, pronounce your name? I know that you're not proud. So why this elaborate explanation of who you are? I mean, I asked him, this God the Father. Then he looked at me, he laughed, he smiled. He said, that's what you think. He said, but I tell you what. He said, if you don't know me, according to every one of these names that I pronounced before Moses, he said, you will not stand. So what are the names? I want you to listen to how God introduced himself to Moses and to us. In Exodus chapter uh, 34, verse, uh, verses, seven, uh, verses 5 to 7, he says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him, meaning Moses, there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord... That's number one. The Lord God. See, there's a difference between the Lord and the Lord God. If you don't know it, go read Genesis. If you, if you, when you see Genesis chapter one, it says, and God said, and God said, and God said. And then the minute God made Adam, Adam and Eve, his title changed to Lord God. The Lord God, because now he was Lord over Adam. He's still God, but now he has a subject. And then when Adam and Eve disobeyed, his title reverted back to the Lord and to God. You know, so, and since then, he's been trying to tell man, I'm your Lord. Make me your Lord God. So he says his name is the Lord, the Lord God, number, uh, number three, merciful. You must know him as a God who is merciful, gracious. You know, uh, I remember one time, I said to God the Father, I said, uh, uh, you said, the, the Lord Jesus said that we are going to do the greater works that uh, he did because he's going to be with you. So how come we're not seeing the greater works? And out of his mouth comes, that's because I am gracious. See, he introduced himself as gracious. He said, because I am gracious. I said, what do you mean? He said, because my children want me to unleash them against the devil to go do destruction in his kingdom. He said, but if I should unleash them the way they ask me, and the devil comes in anger or in uh, retaliation against 
most of them, he said he can take them out with one visit. Therefore, in his graciousness, he holds you back so that you don't go and do things that will result in your total annihilation by the enemy because you have so many open doors. He said they have so many open doors to the devil that if he came against them one time, he can take them out because of the open doors. So that, that is why you see that when you're asking God to put you in ministry, to use you to do this, God is busy, rather, plucking up the holes in your life and the, in your character so that you can be a God, I mean, you can be a, a representative that will stand when the devil comes to visit you. Otherwise, when the devil comes to visit you and you're fornicating, you're doing all the things that the Bible says not to do, when he comes in your, in your house one time, he will destroy you. And I, I tell you, because when the devil used to come in my room, I mean, initially I would pray like 30 days and people are praying, and then it came down to about maybe a week. And then finally, the last time I saw him in my bedroom, and I looked at him, and I said, that you are, you are lousy at your job. You know, because one of the things that the, the devil, you will never hear him talk to you. Uh, he will speak words into your head. Because the Lord yanked his tongue out. Then he looked at me and was like, what do you mean? I said, because you've been at this job since before Adam was created. And I got born again in the 90s and I'm kicking your behind. But before I could say that statement, I had to wrestle with the, 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 the serpent, the, the devil coming like in Jezebel. And this spirit pursued me like over the Sahara Desert. We are running and running. Her hair is uh, nothing but snakes. And she pulled one of her hair and she made a bow. And she launched the, uh, the, the bow, which was a serpent, against me. Because I kept running and running until I got tired. Then I turned around. And I, may have, I must have spoken something against her, the word of God. And I watched as that bow that was a serpent turned, made a U-turn against her. And the snakes in her head began to bite her. As the arrow that she had sent against me pierced her. You know, so you have to do business with the devil and defeat him. And the devil will come. Initially, he came and offered me a crown to be his uh, queen. And he said that God will accept the union because it is written that the lion and the lamb will lie down together. And I said, no, even though I didn't know scriptures, I had something just told me, you can't trust this guy because I had just been born again. You can't trust him. And uh, then he got angry and said, you are a fool. You know, in his thought, and he left. You know, so he's going to come and come again and try you until initially God will make you to lose the fear of the devil. And then you're standing your ground. You know, so that Satan can say, Jesus I know, Mary I know, who are you? Because nobody is going to do it for you. You have to be able to speak the word of God and use the grace of God, the power of the, uh, that the Lord Jesus gave us and his name to go after the devil and to, to stand and dwell in the secret place. And the Lord told me initially, he said, whenever I find righteousness and truth on your side, I defend you. That's the secret place. In a place of righteousness and truth. You know, it, there was even a day of the devils, about 12 of, of them, got around against me, me uh, with them, in people, in the hospital, in the psychiatric hospital, and I'm looking at them. And the Holy Ghost stood and said, if you lie, I cannot defend you. And one of those demons spoke to one of the, the doctors and said, you had a dream last night. Tell us about your dream. I lived alone at the time. I lived alone. And my knees began to buckle. Like how in the world would this doctor know that I can see the Spirit speaking through him? You know? And the Holy Spirit said, if you lie, I cannot defend you. Because the devil had told me, I'm going to make sure they lock you up and throw away the key. You know? So God is gracious. And he's going to walk with you until you lose the fear of the devil. And until you can hold your ground. In, in the now, you can hold your ground. You can overcome. When you overcome, when the Lord said to him that, oh, that overcome, I give a white stone. Last year, he brought me a white stone. And I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. 
Because you have to overcome. But he's gracious. In other words, he walks with you. You know, little by little, you take baby step, you take um, adult step, you take giant step, until you are able to stand as his representative, and but he's the one doing the work through you, not in your power. You know, so God, you have to know him as the God who is gracious. And then he said another name, long suffering, patient, patient. You know, if you look at the world today, if you are not with God, who would have folded the whole thing up? And go like enough is enough but god when i asked him i said why father did you not end the world with the holocaust and all this the world war the second world the first war and all this uh, i mean slavery all the people that have killed so many millions then he looked at me and he smiled he said but i saw you i said because of us he said because look at the people that are praising him today you are not he saw us, and for the joy that he saw in us, he endured those things. God is long-suffering, so you have to know him as long-suffering. And he said, and abundant in goodness and truth. So you have to know him as the one who is abundant in goodness and truth, because there are, there are times in your life the devil will come to you and tell you that God has been unfair to you, and the way he says it to you, is that it's not going to come in your presence and go, oh, God has been un uh, unfair to you. He uses your circumstances. Look at this person prospering. Everything is going for them, going their way. I mean, they are prospering and they are living like hell. Here you are praying all the time, trying not to do uh, evil, trying to be on the, uh, on the right path, and you've been struggling, and all your life is nothing but struggle. Why? Because he wants you to derail. He doesn't want you to know God as the one that is abundant in goodness and truth. Because he cannot fail, he cannot lie, you know? So when uh, such times come, what do you do? You remember, remember the Bible says count your blessings. Remember your salvation. Remember how God has delivered you. Remember all the things he's brought you to through. Remember the good things that he has done for you. And then you will not be despair, and you will not begin to charge him as the God who is not there for you, you know. And then he says in verse seven, "Keep him mercies, keep him mercy for thousands." In other words, your act of uh, goodness will result in mercy to a lot of people, thousands that came from you. Up to, I mean, thousands of them that came out of your loins will benefit. That's why you see a lot of people who apparently are rich today, if you go in their background, some of them have praying grandmothers, people who, were, who paid a price to pay the way for them, but they came and they got money and then they forgot about God. But God says he is the one that keeps mercy for thousands. He says forgiving iniquity. Remember I told you iniquity is doing things your own way. Forgiving transgressions when you transgress his commandment and sin so you must know god as the god who forgives your iniquity who forgives transgressions who forgives sin you know and this is the biggie and that we by no means clear the guilty this is our topic this is why you need to know god so that you don't face him as your judge in the future who will by no means clear the guilty Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and the fourth generation. This is serious. This is why a lot of people are dealing with generational curses. When your father chose to go and become a Freemason, he felt he was exercising or your mother an instant star or to go join an old cult. Literally, did they know that they, they were pledging not just themselves, but the seed that they carried in them for the next four generations. And so those generations are going to come and the devil go, yeah, you from the Freemason lineage, I got you. You from the witchcraft uh, lineage, I got you here too. Oh, you, you joined the occult, I got you. And so you have a lot of Christians who are struggling with generational curses because they were sold into uh, that kind of slavery by the generations before them. Or one who went and raped another person. Well, what do you think is going to happen to their children? 
they will either be raped or they will be rapists for the next four generations. Four hundred years. You know? So you have to be uh, sure that you know God as the God who is good, but as a God who you can't bribe. If you don't repent, your sin remains and you will face him as your judge. So remember, the, uh, the topic is facing God as your father rather than as your judge at the end of your life. And so what did God do to make sure that we are able to come to him? He sent his son to go to the cross for us. And in that cross, the Lord Jesus fulfilled the death sentence that we were on, that the soul that sinned, it shall die. So he died in our place. So now God has accepted the Lord Jesus' blood because in another place it says, if you shed man's blood, then by your blood, your blood shall also be shed. And the Lord fulfilled this requirement to satisfy God's righteousness because you can't bribe him, you can't circumvent his law. It has to be fulfilled. And to tell you how serious it is, he himself came in his word, stepped into humanity, saved us, and went back. This is why Jesus said, I am my father, I won. I came from him, his word. God came into this earth, stepped into humanity, paid our sins, death, and then went back into heaven after he rose again from the dead. And so now he gives us righteousness when we believe in him. So this is God's requirement that now, since the Lord Jesus Christ has paid the sin debt for us, all the people who believe in him, who look forward to his coming, and those of us now that are looking at the cross, because the cross happened behind, you know, so there were those that were looking forward to it, and now we look back and we see the cross. So we all meet in Him. Every single person who believes in Him, God gave to His Son. As many as believes in Him, the Lord Jesus has given power by the Holy Spirit to become sons and daughters of the living God. This is why when you want to get, get to God, another way you will have a problem because no any other religion has satisfied God's uh, judgment God's death sentence on man except Christ which you find in Christianity that his blood alone takes away sin and God's death sentence now you have a free will that God has given you so you can practice Buddhism if you like, you can practice Islam, you can practice New Age, you can believe in yourself as your God. But when it's all said and done and you close your eyes in death, what you're going to find on the other side is that the door to eternal life, to a blissful existence with God is not open for you because you did not come the right way. Jesus said, I am the door. Nobody, nobody comes to my father but my, by me. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the father but by me. He didn't say through me, he said by me. If you see him in heaven, as I told you before, his, his hands are like that in prayer. And people are just entering into him from every direction on earth. Because you have to be in Christ to enter God's heaven. Because when he steps into the Holy of Holies, he steps into where the Father is. All that are in him also step in together with him. This is why the Bible says that we are heirs of God. It's not like, oh, because uh, Jesus uh, is sitting in one place, then we are coming to come join him. No, we are in him. If he's heir of God, we are heirs because we are part of him. He is our body. I mean, he's our head. We are his body. We are not independent of him. It's his spirit that comes and dwells in you the minute you get born again. So you have to take this message seriously. You know? So what is God's requirement for being saved and for being his child? 
he loves us and doesn't want people to remain in sin. He doesn't want anybody to be separated from him. He wants us as his children. We are like his children that went astray and he wants us back. I mean, for those who have children that have run away from home, you can relate to this because you try to find your child, you uh, uh, enlist a private investigator, you try to find out where the child may be. But God knew where we fell into. He came down and he saved us. Now he's saying that if you believe in what he did for, for us in his son, you will be saved. You know, that's that mercy that he's, he's talk, he talked about. He said, who full of grace and he's full of mercy. You know, so let's look at John chapter 3, verses 14 to 18. The Lord Jesus talking. He said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. If you remember when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, why did he lift it up? Because the people were being beaten by serpents. So the serpent is a form of sin. The serpent is a form of sin. So, therefore, when Jesus was on the cross, he became our very own sin. I mean, if you, can, you can imagine when the Lord was on the cross and the people thought he was, God had cursed him because they saw him changing. Remember, people that had leprosy, people that had insanity, people that had all kinds of skin disease, they began to show up on this man on the cross. They began to see Jesus change before their eyes. That is why when you see the Lord Jesus on the cross, I mean, you cannot eat. You cannot eat when you see him. When the Lord showed me the vision of him. But because he took our sins and became the very sin. And God punished that sin by punishing Christ. You know? So he says uh, in verse 16, For God, why did God do all this? He said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. You see, the message of salvation is not a message of condemnation. Rather, it is a message of redemption. Good news. Christ has paid for your sin. You don't need to pay for yourself. Believe in him and God will forgive you your sin and give you the gift of righteousness and give you the grace to live a, a righteous, holy life until he comes back for, for, for us all on the day of rapture. And if you happen to die before then, you step into glory with him. You know? He says, uh, but that the world through him might be saved. See, God doesn't want the world condemned. He wants the world through his son saved. He said, but, but uh, that he, uh, he that believeth in him should not be condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. So when you hear the gospel and you don't believe, your own mouth on the day of judgment will rise up, your tongue will rise up and condemn you. Have you ever seen somebody's own tongue slap them? Your tongue will come out and condemn you and slap you because you heard the good news and you did not believe and now you're dragging the soul to hell. Your soul doesn't want to go to hell, so it will condemn you. Why? Is it because that he had not believed in the name of the only begotten of the Father, you know, his son. So you have to make sure that when the gospel comes to you, that you believe it. And if you don't know who Jesus is, it's very simple. It's explained to us in uh, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 12. Who Jesus is and what he came to give us. Listen to this. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. Remember again Genesis chapter 1 where God was saying, let there be, let there be, and there was? Guess what? That was the word, Jesus Christ, going to perform by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why anything that God does involves him, his word, and his spirit. 
So Jesus existed as the word of God until God spoke his word into the womb of a 16-year-old back nine months later out comes Jesus, walking, talking, son of the living God. You know? So he said, without him was anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So when you receive the Lord Jesus and you receive the life of God in him, he lights you up. He brings you out of darkness. This is why the Lord looked at us and said, ye are the light of the world. Ye are the salt of the earth. What do you use light for? To see in darkness. You use salt to season things that are blind and to preserve and to heal wounds, you know. In the verse 10, he says, And he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him believe or have faith in him, in other words, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name. So as soon as you tell the Lord Jesus you believe, in what he did for you on the cross. You believe in his name, you believe and receive it. God counts that for you as righteousness. And then when you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you become a son or a daughter of the living God. And I told you that there is a difference between those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They are transformed by the Holy Spirit into the sons and daughters of the living God. You know, so after you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, the next thing that you need to do is to make sure that you have or live a good Christian life. In other words, you're going to live according to the Word of God. You're going to fear God enough to stay away from sin and not rationalize anything. You will pursue holiness because righteousness was given to us as a gift when we believe. But holiness is what you do. How you sanctify yourself, you avoid the things that defile so that when you stand before God, you're without spot or wrinkle by the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot get saved and run around and fornicate and steal and kill and say that because you pray the prayer of salvation and ask the Lord Jesus into your house, I mean into your heart, that you're heaven bound. You'll be deceiving yourself. Because the Bible says that without holiness, no man shall see God. So after you receive the gift of righteousness, God expects you to move on to holiness. As we're going to see, because remember, the title of, the, of this uh, teaching is Facing God as your Father, not as your Judge. Because the Lord Jesus, when we come to you, you're going to see that when we come before him, he said he has rewards. You know? So, but meanwhile, after you get saved, you pursue holiness, you love your God. And the Lord told us, it's not, you know, a lot of people think that they love God by going, when they hear somebody preaching, they start crying, they start rolling on the ground, carrying on. No! Jesus said, this is he who loves me. He that obeys my commandments. So you can cry all you want, you can roll on the ground all you want. If you don't obey God, Jesus said you don't love me. This is he that loves me, he that obeys me. So you love God, you love your neighbor. You love your neighbor enough not to cheat them, not to be greedy or envious or covetous of what they have, not to steal from them. You have to pursue holiness by avoiding these things because the Lord told us that the things that defile actually come from the human heart. Evil thoughts, covetousness, things that you think about are the things that will defile you and make you unholy. And also you've got to bear fruit for the kingdom. Because the, the Lord told us in John 15, that in verse 16, if you don't bear fruit, the Father comes and does what? He snips it. He cuts you away. He so said, you become like a dead branch. You know, there are some people who became a Christian 40 years ago. They go, I keep my Christianity to myself. Really? What part of going into all the world and preach the gospel did you not hear? What part of spreading the good news did you not hear? And the Lord also said it. He said, if you, if you are ashamed of me, and then I'll be ashamed of you. Come 
uh, the, uh, the, the day of judgment before God and before the angels. You know, so boldly stand up for what you believe, even if it costs you your life. You know, because we, as, you, as you see, we have it seems as we are stepping into the age of persecution. So you have to make up your mind whether you're going to be on the Lord's side or on the in the world. Because if the Lord finds you in the world, you will see him as your judge and not as your father. And then you have to persevere till the end. You can't give up midway. You can't go like, I've, I've tried this Christianity and it hasn't worked for me because I've, uh, I think it was last year, there were two pastors that said that they were not Christians anymore, that they had uh, renounced their beliefs in God. And some uh, prominent people, even the, uh, one of the Christian singer, was questioning his faith in God. See, that's not what God wants. He wants you to endure till the end. He that endures till the end, you cannot give up midway. This is what I was talking about. The Lord said he's coming and he has his rewards with him. So we find this in Revelation chapter 22 verses... Uh, 7 to 14. Let's read it. He said, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of this prophecy, of the prophecy of this book. And then he goes on in verse 11. Listen to this carefully. He said, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. In other words, if it's your choice, your choice to defraud and be greedy and do whatever it takes, the end justify the means for you. He said, if that's what you choose, well, keep at it. Because when he comes, he will give you your reward as an unjust person. He says, so he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. Remember the book of Revelation is written to Christians about the things that will happen. So he's not talking to the world. He said, he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And I told you, filthiness starts from the heart. As the Lord said it, the things that defile, evil thoughts, murder, covetousness, jealousy, envy, you name it, all things bad that you think defile. And then he says, uh, he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. Remember, righteousness was given to us there are some people that God saved and took a chair and sat down. And that's the stage that their Christianity stays. So he says, he that is uh, righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. He says, and behold, I come quickly and my reward was with me. To give every man according as his work will be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do this, uh, his commandment, that they might have right to the tree of life, and that they might enter in through the gate into the city. So God says, he's coming soon. So whatever your choice, remember last week or the week before, I was telling you that God rather have you passionate, whether you like him, be passionate about it, if you don't like him, well, like atheists, you see some of them, they are passionate about their being atheists. But God will meet the, every single one of them in the place where they are. So this is how it goes. To the Christians, they will see God as the Father or as their Father. We are going to see him as our Father. And... We hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Because we made it to the end. We endured till the end. We overcame. You know? And we will inherit eternal life. We get to, uh, to be with the Lord Jesus forever. Can you imagine that? Forever you're with the Lord Jesus. Because when you're in his presence, he's everything your soul ever desires. He's everything you ever wanted. Wrapped up in this God that we have. And when you stand before him, you have no problem. Everything is just perfect. So you get to be with him forever. You know? And you receive rewards such as cities, mansions, and positions of authority. Somebody is going to be given the United States of America. Somebody is going to be given Canada. 
Somebody will be governors of different states. Some people will be, uh, instead of senators, I don't know what God will call them, that make the laws. Up to the point of uh, the school level. Some people will be teachers, but some people will be the school principal. They will be the uh, board of education members. You know, so depending on your faithfulness, God will reward you accordingly. So that's why he said, let him that is righteous be righteous, him that is holy be holy. And God doesn't compare one person to another. He judges you based on what you were given. How faithful were you to keep or to perform and complete that which you were given to do. He's not going to compare John and James. No. You will be judged based on what you, you were given. And he said it to him, uh, those who have more, more will be required. So you can't say, because God, God knows there are some people whose parents were Christians. And they grew up in church. So you can say that they have an edge right there. But then there are some people who knew nothing but idolatry and witchcraft and had to come in fighting. To get every way to the end. So there's a difference. So God only, because he's a righteous judge. He knows how to judge every single person. And then, again, those who are, who are Christians will reign and rule with Christ. And exercise dominion with him. Over all of God's uh, kingdom. Throughout all of eternity. And not that awesome? Wonderful, good news. So for us, we need to endure to the end. We need to overcome. We need to keep our faith till the end. But for the world, when he comes, they will see him and many of them will rise up unto what? Condemnation, the Bible says. Because if you're condemned, then you go to hell. And hell eventually will be cast into the lake of fire. So they are going to go from hell to the lake of fire. Like they say from frying pan to fire. Except that it's worse. And then they will suffer everlasting torment. Whereas the Christians are receiving everlasting life. Enjoying everlasting life in other words. But the unbelievers and those who did not take... Uh, God's word seriously and they died in sin or they died living according to the world, they will get counted with the, with the unbeliever because God, remember uh, what he said in uh, Exodus chapter 34, that by no means acquit the guilty. He will not acquit anyone who is guilty. So this is why we, we must make sure that we examine ourselves. That we make sure that we are living according to his word to the best of our ability. And if we sin, we ask God to forgive us. Don't go like, oh, they deserve it. I gave them a piece of my mind. That's the ways of the unbelievers. You know, repent and forgive them. You know? So, after hearing all this, and you want to make a choice for the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to face God as your father and not as your judge. And you've been in other religions that don't have provisions to get back to God. Because some of them believe that you have to be reborn and turn to cow and turn to goat and turn to cat. Who wants that? You know? You want, you want to face God and face him as your father. You cry, Abba, Father. And he says, yeah, welcome home, my child. You know? Not as your judge who is going to go down. To help. So if you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just open your heart to Him and say, Lord, I believe in you. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that God the Father raised you up from the dead to give me life. I want this life. I repent of all my sins. Forgive me. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. And baptize me with the Holy Spirit. Never forget to ask for the Holy Spirit. It makes a difference. Baptize me with, with the Holy Spirit to teach me your word. Help me live according to your word. And to uh, also spread the good news to others. So it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what, where you've been. It doesn't matter what religion you were raised in. When you hear the good news that God so loves you. 
and gave his son to save your soul. Receive it, believe it, because what you believe in your heart, no man can take from you. It doesn't matter who you're living with, they're not going to open your heart to see what you believe. Only God can see what you believe. So receive the Lord Jesus Christ, even if it's in the privacy of your bedroom, in the privacy of your home, and make sure you start working out your salvation. So at the end, you will face God as your father and not as your judge. Because when you get there, you're not going to be able to blame another person and go like, my government didn't allow me to become a Christian. Now the message is it's available uh, via internet, YouTube, you can receive the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many people preaching the gospel. Receive it in the privacy of your home. You don't have to go broadcast it to uh, your authority that are uh, uh, endorsing uh, either communism or some other form of uh, unbelief or another religion. Just believe it in your heart. Talk to God. Learn to pray. Buy a Bible and study your Bible in the privacy of your home. Until the Lord comes, be faithful. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Thanks.